Good evening and welcome to Burnsville Park and National Resource Commission meeting for uh, April 23rd, 2018. Uh, our first item for, for business is to approve our agenda for this evening. Commissioner, any item to add to the agenda? Hearing none. Uh, staff, any item? Nothing from staff. Okay. Uh, Commissioner would like to have a motion to approve today's agenda. Motion approved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion moves. Our second item is citizens' comments. Seeing none, we'll move to our third uh, item, approval of minutes for March 19, 2018. Uh, staff, any revision to the minutes? Nothing from staff. Commissioners, you see any you want to? Okay. Um, would like to motion to approve the minutes for March 19, 2018 meeting. So moved. Second? Second. All in? Aye. 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 Motion moves. Our fourth item is bluff uh, fin design and wetland replacement uh, plan. Presenting will be um, Julie Dorschek, Recreation and Community Service Manager. And then Sarah Floyd will be presenting and then Caleb. Or you, they're assisting you. They are assisting, assisting. you. Assisting. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Good evening, evening. Chair Ralph and members of the commission. Thanks for having us this evening. Um, as um, Chair Ralph mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking about the Lake Marion Greenway Rose Bluff final design and the wetland replacement and impact plan. A uh, quick agenda is a overview of the Lake Marion Regional Trail System. And then um, Sarah will be our consultant with Rose, with Bolton and Mink. We'll mm -hmm. be going through the design and the alignment information for you. And then Caleb Ashling will go through the wetland impacts and the replacement plan. Um, I'll come back up and talk really quickly about the timeline and the budget and look for any comments or questions and then ask for your approval of the recommendation for the um, process to move forward. The Lake Marion Greenway was established by, the, by Dakota County back in 2013 and Burnsville segment of this is about four different components. Um, we brought to you the southern component of this trail back in November. Uh, you'll recall that it went from Kelleher Park to Sunset Lake, or Sunset Pond Park here in Burnsville. And then there's another segment in the middle there that um, goes from Sunset Pond up to Williams Drive. The part we're talking about tonight is from Williams Drive down to the Kramer Nature Preserve. There's another segment that is intended to be completed at some point down the road is to make that connection from Kramer Nature Preserve down to the Minnesota River Greenway. That hasn't been identified exactly how that's gonna take place yet. Um, once we start working on the Minnesota Riverfront quadrant um, parcel, maybe um, hopefully we'll figure that part out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Lloyd with Bolton and Mink. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Julie. Good evening, commissioners. Um, so Rose Bluff Trail, I'm just gonna kind of talk through the alignment, the layout, and the kind of process that we've taken to get to this point tonight. Um, this really started back in 2014 with a permanent easement agreement with the Rose Bluff development. So there's a permanent easement as a part of that development uh, that was um, dedicated in 2014. We began preliminary design in 2015. We re reviewed multiple layouts for the corridor, which I'll talk about here in a couple of slides. Uh, what we are proposing is a 10 foot wide bituminous trail with a two foot buffer on either side of the trail. We utilized MnDOT bikeway facility design manual for our design guidelines as we were looking through the design here. And then final design started late last fall after the city obtained some grant dollars for this project. Uh, so just talking through the alignment, starting at the south end at Williams Drive and Judicial Road. Again, as Julie mentioned, this is where the uh, Lake Marion Greenway is gonna be connecting up with this at Judicial and Williams Drive. On this figure, the orange indicates the bituminous trail that we are proposing. So adjacent to Williams Drive, we are paralleling it there uh, within city right-of-way on the south side of St. James Lutheran Church. To stay within right-of-way, we do need to construct a small, short retaining, retaining wall there. 
Um, and then we've got a trail crossing at uh, the west side of Judicial Road, crossing Williams Drive. Uh, Williams Drive in this area carries high volumes of traffic, upwards of 11,000 vehicles per day. East of uh, Judicial Road, they're traveling at 40 miles per hour. West of Judicial Road, they're traveling at 45 miles per hour. So we have a high volume of traffic traveling at some pretty decent speeds there. So one of our concerns here is uh, pedestrian safety for that crossing. If you review the city's pedestrian crossing policy, this really meets the requirements for the re most robust crossing that the, uh, that the um, policy puts forth, which includes uh, marked crosswalk and advanced crosswalk warning signs, and then the pedestrian activated RRFBs, which are rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which I'll show you on the next slide, and then also uh, to give consideration to a median refuge. So we are proposing all of those things at this crossing. Uh, this is a similar crossing. This is not a rendering of what will take place on Williams, but it does give you an idea of the uh, pedestrian activated RRFBs on the, that will be on the north and south side of the intersection. And we are proposing a median refuge for pedestrians crossing that area too. So uh, when a pedestrian walks up to this, pushes the activation button, um, that light starts flashing, gives motor, uh, motorized vehicles, the, the drivers, kind of that heads up that, that a uh, pedestrian is there and will be crossing. So those vehicles will stop there. And if needed, a uh, refuge uh, midway through the uh, crossing for pedestrians if needed. Um, this one, you might be familiar with these. There's, uh, there are a couple of the RRFBs over by uh, the hospital along, uh, I believe it's, is that McAndrews there, or Nicollet, Nicollet Boulevard, Nicollet. I believe, yes. Uh, so back to the alignment, again, the orange here is the trail. Uh, now I wanna just quick, briefly talk about the green here, which is a sidewalk. We are proposing a sidewalk extension from the, uh, where the trail heads north, heading west into Savage. Uh, the city of Savage has walk along um, what is McCall Drive within the city of Savage uh, through the bridge there. So we are proposing to go and connect up to that bridge with sidewalk. Uh, we have met with public works staff for the city of Savage and they are interested in completing this connection and staff is currently working on a joint powers agreement with the city of Savage so that they will be paying um, their portion of the construction in that area. Continuing north with the trail, uh, we are heading north through that trail easement that I mentioned. Uh, again, we've got the 10-foot trail within a 20-foot trail easement adjacent to both St. James Lutheran Church and the Rose Bluff development. Uh, we are able to stay within that easement for the most part. We also have a drainage and utility easement in that area. We will go into a little bit of that within the church property, and we're coordinating with them on that work. <clears throat> And then the, the fun part of the project, the, of, of the alignment, uh, down the bluff. Uh, this area uh, is, it was the most challenging part of the entire project, uh, navigating existing grades of between zero and 20%, um, navigating some different challenges being um, just overall area constraint to, to the east and the west. We also have a Magellan high pressure petroleum pipeline going through that area, as well as um, overhead XL power lines, and so navigating around the power poles as well. Mm. So that's how we landed here with the, the number of switchbacks that we did. During preliminary design, we did look at what are the options here. Could we go you know, straight down that bluff? Um, really wasn't feasible. From a construction standpoint, it would mean a significant amount of fill mm -hmm. along with some pretty major retaining walls to get that to work with the grades that we're trying to meet with design standards. Um, and then the number of switchbacks that you see, those switchbacks that I'm referring to are just the, the overall turns along the corridor. Um, those are dictated, again, by the design standards. We have to have a, a certain radius on those, those curves and then overall slopes of the trail uh, to meet some design standards. Uh, we do have some steeper areas within the slope that are um, upwards of 8.2% for um, about 350 feet, I believe, so a little bit longer and steeper than we would like. Uh, but to navigate this area, it was necessary. Uh, within that steeper area, we are proposing uh, to have a, a resting spot uh, with a couple park benches and trash receptacles. So if someone is um, biking or, or walking in that area and needs a, a little break, um, they'll have that 
uh, that opportunity. Um, we also have uh, wetlands within this area and the, some trees too that we were uh, working, uh, working with as well. Continuing north into the Kramer Nature Preserve, there is an existing dirt and gravel path through this area, and we are proposing to follow that alignment uh, for, the, for the bituminous trail. As you work your way to the trailhead that currently exists by the parking lot, um, we are proposing to add a park bench along with trash and recycling receptacles, uh, a bike fix ex fix it station similar to that which is at the Black Dog Trailhead, and a bike rack. So that is the trail alignment and trail components kind of in a nutshell. Um, I also want to mention that we hosted an open house in February and had a number of people from the Rose Bluff development um, along with other area residents on hand to ask questions and learn more about the project. Overall, the project was well received by the residents. A um, couple of the primary concerns that they brought up were the, the um, high volumes of traffic along Williams and that crossing. So by adding that um, median and that, um, those RRFBs at that crossing, that should help with that, that concern. Uh, and then also the layout traversing uh, that lovely slope there and the tree <coughs> removal, that was also a concern. Um, so we are working with uh, a couple residents there on that and still talking through some of those, those tree removals and, and whatnot. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to Caleb to talk about the wetland replacement plan. Thank you. All right, good evening, commissioners. Okay, just a, a quick overview about uh, why we're, uh, we're bringing this information here um, for our viewers at home. So the Wetland Conservation Act regulates wetlands within the city of Burnsville. The city of Burnsville is the local governmental unit in charge of administering the Wetland Conservation Act. Uh, any proposed impacts to wetlands in the city are re uh, reviewed by city staff and the technical evaluation panel. That uh, TEP panel is made up of uh, local experts. Uh, so there's a representative from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, uh, someone from the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and Dakota Soil and Water Conservation District, as well as city staff. Uh, then for any uh, wetlands where impacts are proposed and a replacement needed, uh, PNRC and city council will review those re uh, replacement plans. So just a quick uh, run through of some of the major items related to the wetland process with this project. Uh, the wetlands in the proposed trail corridor were delineated uh, back in July of 2006 by Bolton and Mink. Uh, that delineation was reviewed by the technical evaluation panel. Uh, then the city and consultants worked to determine the best trail route and how best to avoid or mitigate wetland impacts where possible. Uh, then there were some impacts uh, necessary, so a wetland replacement plan was developed, and then that plan was again reviewed by that technical evaluation panel and city staff. Uh, so this map here on the right side shows the wetland impacts or proposed wetland impacts associated with this project. Uh, they're in three main areas, and I'll just describe the map a little bit here. Uh, the black lines on the map uh, are the construction limits for this project. The green lines are areas that were delineated as wetland. Um, then the red and yellow hash marked areas were wetland areas where there was proposed impacts. Uh, and between the three areas where there was proposed impacts, uh, there, the total size of impacted wetlands were 0 0.15 acres, so a relatively small impact. Uh, then the wetlands, uh, you can see they're called type 2 or type 3. Uh, type 2 wetlands are considered wet meadow type habitat. Uh, type 3 are shallow marsh type wetlands. Uh, so then just looking a little bit again at uh, why these locations for the trail were selected. Um, Again, as Sarah mentioned, this northern half of the trail in red there is on an existing trail grade. So although there are some uh, wetland impacts uh, in a few spots where the trail needed to be widened, overall the impact is fairly minimal because we're following an existing grade versus creating a new trail somewhere else. Then as you get to uh, the hillside there, due to some of the grade issues and having to create switchbacks, 
Uh, we weren't able to avoid some wetland impacts in that area as well. Uh, so because there were some wetland impacts associated with this project, uh, the city is required to come up with a replacement plan. And that replacement plan has to have a two to one of replacement ratio. And those wetlands uh, that are uh, in the plan need to be of similar type. Uh, so to meet those requirements, the city is proposing to purchase 0 0.3 acres, um, so twice the impact proposed with this project, uh, 0 0.3 acres of wetland credit uh, from uh, Lyon County. Uh, they'd be type two wetlands, uh, and the total cost would be around $12,400. Uh, because we needed a wetland of similar type to meet the requirements, we weren't able to purchase wetlands in Dakota County or a closer county. We had to uh, purchase credits from Lyon County. Uh, then again, uh, or the wetland credits are, are part of the state-operated wetland bank, so organizations can restore wetlands in other areas, uh, get their wetland restorations approved by the state, and make those credits available to other organizations, like the city of Burnsville. Uh, then if we have a, a project where we're going to be impacting some wetlands, the city can purchase those credits, uh, and then those credits that we purchase are held in a perpetual conservation easement by the state. So the credits that we purchase, in this case uh, proposed for Lyon County, would be held in a conservation easement. Uh, then the city's wetland replacement plan has been uh, reviewed by that technical evaluation panel and approved. So uh, just in summary of why we feel these wetland impacts are necessary for this project, uh, avoidance was not feasible, um, and by using this existing trail corridor, uh, we're able to reduce the overall impact versus having to create a new trail somewhere else. Uh, the impacted wetlands in this area are of low quality. Uh, this is a highly disturbed site. It's under power lines. There's a gas uh, pipeline through the corridor as well, so there's been a lot of disturbance through the years in these areas. Uh, then this trail itself will be a significant community amenity and also uh, increase awareness of the nature preserve. So although there, there's a negative aspect of wetland impact, there are some positive impacts of bringing more people to the nature preserve and uh, getting them outside and recreating in the park. Um, and because of uh, some of these positive aspects of the project, uh, staff recommends the approval of the replacement plan. I think that's all I have. Thank you. All right, uh, to summarize here, um, the City Council um, will be reviewing the replacement plan, hopefully as approved by the PNRC um, on May 8th, so next month. Oops, I'm sorry, I went too far. Um, and then after that, then we'll take the final design to City Council in June uh, for their approval. And then we'll look to be advertising for bids and moving into construction late June with the construction taking place in the fall. Um, the budget for this is $680,000 total, um, of which a $150,000 DNR local connections grant was received by the city or awarded to the city back in 2017. And in order to meet the guidelines set a step that were established by the DNR, um, we need to move forward with our construction this fall and be um, significantly complete with the construction by June 30th of next year. Um, and the city and the county, they share in the funding for the, tr the remaining cost of the trail, 50-50. It's as a part of the regional trail pros prospect. Um, does the commission have any questions for staff or our consultant? Go ahead, please. Um, regarding that existing trail that we're going to follow most of the, the, the time, that's been in existence for quite some time. Did it mess up the wet, wetlands um, when it went in? And did it get to avoid all the kinds of things that we have to deal with now? Let me pull back up our <laughs> one of our natural resources staff, please. Yeah, I guess I don't know the answer f for that for sure. Uh, my understanding is that trail has been around for quite a long time. Um, so uh, it may not have had some of the same requirements that this project uh, has. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, so we would like to have um, approval for the final design. That's what the request is for today? Uh, both the final design and the wetland replacement Respect. plan. Okay. We'd like to have a motion. So, so moved. Second. 
second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion approves. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for helping us. Okay. Next uh, item is framework planning server results. JJ Ryan, uh, Recreation and Facility Superintendent, will be presenting. And there's no formal action for this one. That is correct. That's correct. Uh, commissioners, good evening. Um, I'm excited tonight to share this information with you. Um, as you know, we've uh, been working on our parks master plan for quite a while now. And uh, after you approved that master plan in the fall, we then went back out to our residents and asked them to take a look at the frameworks plan um, and evaluate for us or give us some feedback on how they would like us to prioritize that, that frameworks plan. And they've done that. And I've got this information for you tonight. Uh, the information in your background uh, has the results as well. And I think it shared with you that we had uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 650 uh, residents uh, weighing in on, on uh, giving us their opinion on how uh, we should spend our time and energy working towards accomplishing these goals. So it was a, it was a great response by our residents. And very appreciated. Uh, commissioners, here it is. Uh, They've, uh, you and other residents have voted and, and they've said that uh, they want to make the high quality natural areas the number one priority as we continue to uh, work on our park and recreation system master plan. Trails is a very close second. Playgrounds, basic services, uh, community facilities, recreation programs and events, uh, sport courts and fitness, athletic fields, open spaces, uh, communications and, and revenue generation. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk through each of these 10 areas with you, uh, tell you about uh, some of the projects that have already been um, taken care of or we've already accomplished, and then maybe highlight some things that are coming up in 2018, 2019, and then um, uh, this will kind of serve also as a little bit of an update that you would ask for during your uh, planning session about you want an update on the master plan and where we are so kind of accomplishes two things here tonight uh, so first off the high quality natural areas um, Caleb uh, was telling me that uh, we've been doing uh, work in uh, habitat restoration since uh, 1996 and uh, our projects in the city of Burnsville are prioritized through the natural resources master plan and that includes uh, invasive species control uh, controlled burns and water quality monitoring and testing. So those are some of the areas that we've been already working on uh, here in Burnsville. Um, as you know, recently we've completed the Keller Lake stormwater project. Uh, you've had a first-hand look at this and approved uh, this project along the way. You can see it removes over 70 pounds of phosphorus each year. Um, and um, I imagine that at some point in time, we'll, uh, we'll get an update again from Caleb and Daryl on how this project is, is continuing to work. Um, we've been out in Terrace Oaks where they've uh, completed the, uh, the 19 acre restoration and the, the Buckthorn project out there. Um, day and night uh, improvements as we stood right out there in the middle of the trail and, and just kind of in awe at how, how great it is. Um, again, pictures of uh, the project here, and then uh, as completed and, and com um, reseeded here with wildflower mix and, and, and whatnot. And then um, other projects that uh, they've completed uh, in and around the city. Um, show you all three pictures there. This is a trail around Early Lake. Uh, Caleb and Daryl utilized a state program um, of prison worker crews. Um, to benefit the, the community, they went out and removed the buckthorn um, around uh, Crystal Lake West, Early Lake, and Sunset Pond. And you can see, again, uh, some great improvements made in those areas uh, here around Early Lake. Um, another project that we have coming up yet this year now is a pilot pot project uh, for goat grazing. Um, again, uh, maybe you saw it on the way in right behind the ice arena here. They've come through and they've cleared out the buckthorn initially, the bigger stalks of buckthorn. And then this fall we'll be bringing the goats in to 
kind of maintain that area, and we'll see how that goes. It's kind of uh, an interesting project. I know that our natural resource people have been getting a lot of questions about that. But that should take place the fall of, of this year. Uh, we're also going to be working uh, with the DNR to uh, in, in ramp up our inspections of um, invasive aquatic species and uh, those moving from lake to lake. So there will be uh, inspectors on site down at Crystal Lake uh, every weekend um, and holiday from the fishing opener through, uh, through Labor Day. So um, that's, a, that's a great improvement that we've got happening there as well. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear more about this one as well. Uh, another 26-acre uh, savanna restoration, restoration at Terrace Oaks, uh, buckthorn and weedy tree removal. Uh, plan for later this winter. Uh, so you can you can see that our natural resources folks have been very busy prior to the master plan coming out, prior to the results, and now they've got even more work ahead of them as uh, as we continue to move forward. Um, another area we just heard we just heard about this one is our trail connections. Uh, this was one of the areas in our master plan that uh, required a little bit of work, and we think that uh, Julie and the team that she's got have accomplished uh, the goals that we now have. Uh, she just talked about the Lake Marion uh, Greenway and the two connections there, the Rose Bluff segment and the Sunset Pond segment. Um, you were part of the uh, Minnesota River Greenway project last year, the kickoff event that took place. And then, uh, oh, sorry about that. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So again, the two projects that uh, they just spoke of. And then the other thing that uh, we're going to be rolling out here very soon is um, the trail maps that we have. A while back, the city participated in a Healthy City initiative, and one of the things that came out of that was this little pocket or little throw in the glove box of your car trail map. And it was really intended to give to folks to have in their car so that when they were dropping kids off at soccer practice or, or baseball or whatnot, they could uh, figure out what park they're at and, hey, here's a quick two-mile loop I can go walk while my son or daughter is participating in their activity. Um, that was 10 or more years ago, I believe. So uh, we've put some work into updating this uh, book and uh, making it also we'll be making it available online so the hard copy is is nice to have because you have it in the car uh, but it will be it will be available in a different version other than just a eight and a half by 11 pdf on the website as well uh, playgrounds and aquatics was uh, the number three area that uh, residents asked us to focus on um, they ask us to take a look at the play structures that we have in our park systems and, and how we're using them and are those keeping up with the current trends uh, today and are they meeting the ADA accessibility criteria as well. Um, as you, most of you were around when we completed the Lions uh, splash pad uh, down there, so we added the aquatic feature and then we went back and added some additional amenities to accommodate uh, some additional seating and uh, shading around that area. So uh, that's just one highlight area. Uh, as we move forward, we are looking at replacing a playground equipment at the Cedar Bridge uh, neighborhood. Uh, Neal Park is also uh, gaining some accessibility um, accommodations this year. Again, we've got nice play structures over there, uh, but if there are mobility issues, they're a little difficult to get to because there's no sidewalk leading up to the play area. So we'll be adding that this year um, as we improve the stairs over there at Neal Park that go down to the lower level where the ball fields are at. Mm -hmm. uh, Keller Lake play equipment will also be updated this year. Uh, we're still working on our archery range um, and uh, you've seen preliminary plans for that where it is or the range is more accessible for uh, folks with mobility issues there as well. And then, uh, again, when we talk about diversity and the play equipment we have, we'll be talking later tonight about the uh, Terrace Oaks Nature Play Area and how that's going to look and, and uh, what we're going to do to help kick off or open up that uh, play area here in Burnsville. Um, and again, this is staff at, at City Hall are pretty excited about this. I think uh, later tonight when we're talking about it, you, you will too. You'll be excited about it too. Um, Basic 
basic park services. Again, uh, there's some overlap here in addressing ADA uh, accessibility and, and things like that and cultural issues. Um, and uh, we, we believe we're accomplishing the um, ADA uh, needs as we go into each park and as we're working on projects in each park, regardless of how big or how small the project is, we're taking a look at what the needs are in each of those parks. This is a rendering of the dog park at Alla Magnet. Uh, we just completed that project in the, well, just before the snow flew uh, in the winter where we made it more or fully accessible to get in from the parking lot. You may recall that the curb there, there was no curb cut. So again, mobility issues didn't allow for folks to get up to the dog park. And then the small dog park area was expanded to uh, connect over to this entrance so that again, folks with mobility issues could enter the park there. Um, we're we'll talking about uh, recycling in the parks later this fall. That's, again, another project for 2018, one that I know uh, you folks have been working on or pushing for. Uh, we'll be adding drinking fountains to our park system. The first one is uh, set to go in this spring over at the skate park. Um, we're adding, again, accessibility needs to Lac Levon Park near the, um, near the picnic shelter, the volleyball court and horseshoe pit over there. And then Highland Forest is also gaining some accessibility issues with connections from the parking lot to uh, the play structure and then also to the basketball court that will be moving closer towards the parking lot, I believe. Uh, as we talk about community facilities, um, the, the residents uh, were pretty happy with uh, the amenities that we have at the Burnsville Ice Center and at Burnhamwood Golf Course as well as the Ames Center. I've left any improvements off of uh, regarding the AIM Center off of this presentation here tonight, but um, over at the ICE Center, uh, our arena manager, Dean Malso, was pretty adamant to uh, get this project completed. He created a, um, a viewing area and a seating area for folks, again, with mobility issues. Um, he actually created two viewing areas on the main rink, on rink number one, Gary Harker Rink, and then also created a seating area for folks uh, on rink two as well. Again, um, we do have a number of large events there. This weekend is the, um, the ice show. Uh, so again, a number of people will be in and out of there. And I'm sure folks with uh, mobility issues will appreciate the fact that they've actually got a place dedicated for them to uh, watch their, their kids or grandkids participate in their activities. Uh, over at uh, Burnham Wood, Dan Hill does a great job keeping the golf course up and keeping it uh, uh, beautiful. Last uh, summer, he planted over 2,800 plants on the golf course. Um, he completed a new fern garden um, that runs along the path. Um, I can't think of the road now. Uh, up leading up to T number seven. And then uh, he also transplanted 73 hostas from City Hall campus here over to Burnham Wood. Those hostas were in jeopardy because they were part of wherever the police station was expanding to. So Dan came over uh, and took care of getting those over to the golf course, found them a new home. So like I said, Dan does a great job of keeping uh, Burnham Wood looking just absolutely beautiful. Uh, recreation programs and events. They asked us to, um, residents asked us to keep up with changing trends and, and make sure our programs are exciting and new. And uh, we believe we've put together some programs for this summer in particular that uh, is a nice starting point for keeping things fresh. Um, we're adding a sneak peek to our summer, uh, summer playground program. That's on May 19th. That'll give um, families a chance to come out, meet the staff that are going to be out at their park sites, uh, maybe get a feel for what the programs are going to be like. We're adding a full day uh, playground option called Camp Explore that will take place at Red Oak Park. Um, we are adding a program called Friday Night Boogie. This is more for adults or geared towards adults. This will take place uh, at Nicollet Commons Park before one of the Friday night movies. It will be an opportunity uh, for adults to come out and socialize, uh, similar to a happy hour event. There will be um, food catered uh, or food options available from either food trucks or from uh, one of the local restaurants for purchase and things like that. So it should be a fun night for adults. Uh, we've added uh, some new camps, some new nature camps, nature nuts, and a youth fishing program. Those are kind of end of summer camps. So again, kind of continuing uh, to extend our summer for, for families that are still looking for activities for their, for their children. 
And then uh, maybe most importantly, we've expanded our scholarship opportunities this year. Uh, each child in, in anyone's family is available uh, to receive up to $75 per quarter to participate in any of the programs that we are offering. And uh, folks, as you know, uh, most of the programs that we offer are set, uh, the, the fees are set to um, just break even. We're not looking, we don't have a policy in place right now to establish a, a major revenue stream, but they're set to break even. And so we think that that along with the $75 scholarship fee, uh, kids and families will have an opportunity to participate in, in programs this summer. Um, as we talk about sport courts and fitness, uh, last month we talked a lot about this one. This is Red Oak Park. Uh, this is the redesign of uh, the current tennis courts that are over there, the four courts that are over there, into six dedicated pickleball courts, one uh, pickleball slash tennis court, and then one tennis only court. Again, this will serve as, probably serve as our primary uh, pickleball location. Um, I think Amber Jacobson is uh, planning on hosting some tournaments here as well, so it should be an opportunity to really uh, utilize this park in a new way that we're, uh, we're excited for. Um, again, this will be happening uh, late summer 2018, so again, uh, looking forward to the completion of this project as well. Um, as we talk about athletic fields and open spaces, um, this is one of the things that we're all aware of that numbers, uh, participation numbers in some of the, the sports that we have, traditional sports, um, are on the decline, uh, bat and ball sports in particular, um, and some, some other emerging sports are starting to really take hold, lacrosse, ultimate, rugby, uh, some of those sports that require more turf areas that we have, um, and, and, and right now we don't have enough turf space to accommodate them. So we'll be looking at ways to work with our youth associations or our athletic groups to figure out what the right balance is for bat and ball sports or those diamond sports and turf sports and how we can accommodate all of those folks. Um, this, this is one area that we haven't had an opportunity to gain any traction yet or, or meet with those people to find out what the needs are gonna be, but this will be coming soon. Communications, uh, we do have a communications department that works with us, uh, and they are in the process, or have been in the process of improving our signage, not just the park signs at some of the, well, community parks, as you've probably seen here at Civic Center, uh, but also our signs interior to the park, um, and then we'll be working on some wayfinding signs as well, but um, those are the sign areas that they've been improving. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. They've also been working on a redesign of the city's website. Um, we had a meeting just a week ago to talk about improvements to functionality, usability, and design. Uh, we'll update uh, the, the look and feel of our website. Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing from our department through their, with their help has been highlighting one new park each month. Uh, so far, we've highlighted the the uh, four parks that you see there, Neil Alamagne at Civic Center in Lac Levan. We've chosen those parks so far because those have been uh, Neil Park. We had outdoor skating and sledding there this winter. Um, Alamagne, we had, we still had the dog park for walking and we had trails over there as well. Civic Center, we talked a lot about uh, the ice skating available at the arena. And Lac Levan, we were supposed to start adult softball <laughs> leagues a week ago. So. We're trying to highlight a park that's in season or relevant to the season uh, participation. And then as I was mentioning, we're updating our park signage. Um, you'll start seeing these around the parks and in the parks as, as uh, you're out and about in the community. So, Revenue generation, again, this, this is uh, nine, number 10 on, on the residents list. Uh, but yet it is still something that we're taking a look at. Uh, we have to continue to provide services to our residents, but we also can uh, do things to um, help improve the economy in our community and stimulate uh, folks visiting uh, local establishments, things like that. Uh, one of the things that were talked about here was try to find a way to bring uh, more food trucks into the parks, and uh, maybe that helps generate more participation in park programs 
as well as provide a local business an opportunity as well. So uh, this is an area that is also a work in progress and this is going to take some time, uh, but it is something that we will be working on in the very near future. That's a lot, commissioners. <laughs> that was, uh, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or attempt to answer them. Go ahead, please. Uh, to take the last one, I was just curious, do the food trucks and the restaurants pay a fee to be at these events? Uh, Commissioner Donaldson, they do, and it depends on, it depends on the situation. Uh, in the, if there is an event in the park and a food vendor is part of the event, if you're holding a private event, mm -hmm. you can bring in your own food truck to cater your event. Um, if we are holding an event in the park, there have been times where food trucks have approached us and asked us to be part of the event, and they've paid a fee for that. Um, in the case of a special event like the International Festival or um, Fire Muster, those groups hosting the event go out and find the food vendors, and they negotiate some type of agreement for having them at their events. So there are some things out there. Uh, but a few years back, we did create a, a policy um, on food trucks and, and allowing them in the parks. And so if there are food truck operators that want to um, show up at the a beach ball. or uh, one of our ball fields, we can make arrangements for them to do that. We've identified areas in each of the parks where they can be. Any other questions? Go ahead, please. Um, so it looks like based on these responses, people have the people of Burnsville have given some pretty clear priorities in terms of high priority areas and then lower priority areas. Do you find this potentially impacting your, your future plans associated with which areas you focus on, such as like the high quality nature plans versus the revenue generation, or do you still plan on kind of focusing on all of them? Uh, great question, Commissioner Newman. Um, one of the things that uh, Garrett Beck, our director, and Jeff Raddick, our um, assistant uh, public works director, work on is our parks capital. Uh, they work on the rehabilitation and then the new and Im Im improvements to the park. So one of the things that they will be doing is making sure that any projects that we do have uh, coming up fall into these categories, and if they don't, um, we're going to address the reason why, and, and we'll go forward from there. But um, there is no new funding for these projects that are, that are listed here or to identify um, high-quality natural areas. We don't have any additional funds that we can direct in that area. But um, as, certainly as we look at our projects for any individual year coming up, we'll, we'll make sure that we're focusing our attention on where the residents have said they, they'd like to see us make the improvements. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Hearing none, thank you very much, JJ. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time. We'll move to our fifth or uh, sixth part, which is advertising signs on ball field fences. Um, JJ Ryan will present that, and we will have a request for um, recommendation that the council accepts the changes to the ordinance as presented. Uh, commissioners, again, thank you. Uh, tonight, uh, this item is, is uh, hopefully uh, a short and simple one. Um, a few years back, we worked with uh, a couple local groups to allow advertising on, on ball field fences. And then at the time, we were also working with the uh, Community Foundation, I believe, to create an opportunity to add advertisements on outdoor ice rinks. Uh, so we, we worked uh, with our um, community development staff and created or updated the city ordinance to allow for advertisement on outfield fences at, at ball fields. And you can see that uh, today out at Alla Magnet on both fields one and two. Um, the local youth sports group, B Baseball Association 191, uh, they go out, they sell the ad space, they work with uh, local businesses to create the windscreens, to put up the advertisements on the windscreens on the fence, and they look very nice, they're done very well, they look very professional. 
And then uh, we've created some type of an agreement with them because, again, they are selling our space for uh, those ads. So we would like some of that revenue to come back to the city so that we can continue to make the improvements to the parks and things, uh, things like that. However, when we wrote the ordinance or when we rewrote the ordinance, I think six or eight years ago, uh, we were a little bit too specific and we talked only about baseball fields and we talked about outdoor skating rinks. And so um, the language that we've uh, corrected here expands the advertising capability to all athletic fields, um, not just baseball fields. And that's important because last fall, the BAC football program approached us and with a banner ready to go and said, can you help us hang this up down at Mel Larson Field at Black Dog Park? And looking at our policy, we our city ordinance, we kind of had to turn them down at that point in time and said, I'm sorry, our policy or ordinance does not allow for that. Uh, so the updates here simply make it easier to allow us to work with our local organizations for them to, to do that. And, and had we had the foresight a few years ago, we would have included all ball fields or all fields back back then. Um, the Planning Commission reviewed the same information on April 9th, and they've already approved it. We're hoping you'll approve this tonight as well, and then uh, it will go to City Council on May 8th for their approval of changes to the city ordinance. Here it is. Uh, the changes are in red. You'll see them stricken where we take out certain language. Um, and then the black language is, is what, what was there and what we're going to be leaving in. Uh, the other details there, the bullet points, number or bullet points, the numbered points, one through six, um, that is information that is all part of a policy that was created a year after the ordinance. So giving us, policies are written to give us the direction on how to carry out these types of ordinances. And when we rewrote the, the ordinance, we, we overdid it with language, basically, um, taking out the policy. So the policy that was created, policy number 1.327, has this information in it for us, providing us the direction on how to handle the lease agreements with our local associations, the types of signs that can be hung up, um, the appropriateness of the size, things like that. So, And then it, it continues to go on here with additional language on how we can carry forward. Uh, commissioners, I believe the red line version of the ordinance was included in your packet. A copy of uh, policy 1.237, I'm sorry, 1.327 was also included in your packet. Uh, those are much cleaner versions, obviously very easy, much easier to read than what's in front of you here on your screens. Um, but tonight we're looking for a motion to approve the changes uh, to the ordinance. And um, with that, our planning commission, I'm sorry, our um, city planners will be taking that to city council for their approval, like I said, on May 8th. So. Questions? I have one. Go ahead, and uh, I have one question. So um, as far as the policy goes, it seems like it's pretty clear that this wouldn't include like neighborhood ball fields that don't have out fence outfield Correct. fencing. Um, but what kind of um, insight do we get into policy changes that may come in the future? Do we do we get to see those policy changes or the policy changes more just at, at the city hall level? Uh, commissioners, um, the, there, there were some changes to policy, uh, this policy 1.327 as well. Um, those changes that were included, um, I don't believe, again, this policy specifically is, for, is from the communications department. Um, and, and the direction was that that was not, your input was not needed on that policy change. Um, I, I'm trying to recall, commissioners, a, a time when we had a policy uh, change that uh, required uh, your review, and it just it doesn't come to mind right now. Typically, the policies that we have don't change that often, and when they are changed, they're changed annually at the end of the year, and it's t usually just small, minor language. Um, the last policy, I believe, that uh, you folks took a look at 
uh, was our legacy events policy because that is very specific to parks and, and the, the use of parks for events like the Fire Muster and International Festival and things like that. Uh, so it, it does happen, Commissioner Newman, that, that uh, this commission does take a look at policy changes. However, I guess in this case, it wasn't required. So the only concern I have is by removing it from the, the city ordinance language. Um, you know, I think I would have a concern if there was ability for it to go into community parks, more of those neighborhood parks that don't have outfield fencing, and then somehow we end up with advertisements on the backstops or whatever that might look like. So with having the language in the policy, I don't know how much insight or pushback a, a resident would be able to proceed with if there was going to be a change in the policy to say that that was applicable. I think the way that it's written is beautiful. I just worry about potentially going in that direction in the future if there is a... a Sure. A desire to gain additional capital from these kind of advertising. Um, Commissioner Newman, I apologize. Maybe I didn't understand your question uh, correctly the first time you asked, but all of the, the city policies, and, as, as well as this one here, are approved by city council, okay. uh, formally approved by city council. So they are reviewed and approved by city council. So it doesn't leave the policy up to me to decide whether or not or, or somebody else in our in the recreation office to decide whether or not an advertising sign should or could go up in a neighborhood park or not. It is it is spelled out and approved by city council. Okay, that's super helpful. Thank you very much for that. Last question. So number five, are we when we are we are crossing these, are we saying that there will not be any boundaries of what kind of advertisement can or cannot go? Chair Roof, um, for example, this number five, uh, all of these no, all of these numbered items are being crossed off and added to the policy oh, specifically. Okay. So Thank it's you. still addressed. Uh, we're still not going to allow alcohol, tobacco, or firearms to be advertised in our city parks. Okay. It's just spelled out in the policy rather than here in the city. Perfect. Office. I just want to make sure that the audience also who are watching has that because when we are seeing that they are crossed, they don't get that, that we are trying to eliminate these kind of things. I just want to make it clear. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Any commissioner, do you have any questions? No? Um, if that's the case, uh, staff is requesting a motion to recommend that city council accept the changes to the ordinance as presented. I would like to have a motion. Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And motion moves. JJ, thank you. That leads us to our seventh item, which is miscellaneous. Uh, Commissioner, any item uh, to report for the miscellaneous? Staff? Uh, commissioners, right now our next uh, meeting is scheduled for May 7th. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later during our work session to determine whether or not that will meet our timeline for planning on the grand opening of the nature play area. Uh, additionally, uh, right now, it's set up as just a work session in May. We don't have any formal items uh, on there right now. However, uh, just late this afternoon, um, Mr. Raddick mentioned that there are some proposed changes to um, Crystal Lake Beach area that may need to come before you prior to the um, season opening up down there at Crystal Lake Beach. So we may have to uh, revise the date and uh, the schedule for that evening. So. Um, please stay tuned. We'll make sure we get the updates out to you as soon as we can. Okay. Thank you, JJ. That brings us to our formal, uh, there is nothing else. That brings us to our end of the formal meeting. Um, Commissioner, would you like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion adjourned. Second. Okay. Favor, aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and mo uh, motion carries. Uh, good evening and thank you for watching uh, National uh, Burnsville Park and Natural Resource Commission meeting.